Hey everyone, so in my video where I responded to Ed's commentary on Joe Rogan's position on hunting, I pointed out that many vegans seem to be unaware of or neglect the suffering happening in the wild. Moreover, when talking about the lives of wild animals, we tend to think about the species as a whole rather than the individual animals themselves. Overall, I was very happy with the positive response to the video. And it's great that so many of you are interested in the topic and have the desire to help animals regardless of whether they're wild or domesticated. There have also been quite a lot of comments asking about what we can actually do about wild animal suffering. And that's a fair question, but it's also an extremely complex and broad question. But let's talk about it. In this video, I'm going to attempt to outline some potentially promising areas for future research from which future interventions could be designed. Now, the multidisciplinarity required to answer questions within wild animal suffering illustrates the complexity of this topic. I'm certainly not painting a complete picture here, but I'll put some resources in the description box for those of you who want to learn more. I'm also going to provide examples of previous interventions that correspond with these areas of research so that it doesn't feel like we're only talking in the abstract. Before we jump into that, though, there's something that I think needs to be highlighted, and that's how under-researched this area is. It's important to note that worldwide, there are currently only a handful of philosophers and researchers working on wild animal suffering. This issue has been, and still is today, incredibly academically neglected. It's highly under-researched and substantially underfunded. This means that there are a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of research yet to be conducted. In fact, it's hard to put into words the extent to which this issue has been neglected when you consider the scale of the problem. In relation to the suffering that currently exists in the world, this is probably the biggest issue on the planet. And yet research looking specifically at how to best reduce wild animal suffering is almost non-existent. The ethical implications of wild animal suffering have also been neglected in philosophy. Historically, there has been a substantial lack of funding, workforce and awareness. And therefore, unfortunately, we barely have any research focused on improving wild animal welfare. Interestingly, I received quite a lot of comments suggesting that there aren't any solutions to wild animal suffering, and therefore I shouldn't be talking about it. But how on earth can we conclude that there are no solutions to a problem that has barely been investigated? Think about it. If we had never started researching malaria, we would never have found any solutions to reduce the suffering this disease causes. I mean, we wouldn't have malaria nets today if when we first started talking about the issue, people said, you've got no solutions, so you shouldn't bother talking about it. As you can clearly see in this example, complaining about a lack of solutions before we've even really tried to find them is incredibly unproductive. In both cases, research can only be conducted once the problem has been acknowledged as such. And I hope you can now see that the fact we know so little about wild animal suffering doesn't mean that we should avoid exploring potential solutions any further. Actually, I think it's kind of the opposite of that. It means we should conduct more research into the lives of wild animals to investigate the most effective ways to improve their well-being. Now that you're aware of how neglected this area is, I'm going to talk about some causes of animal suffering and point out some promising areas for future research that could help us find solutions. I'll then give some examples of interventions that have previously been implemented in the wild. Although these examples come from actions designed to serve human interests, I think they provide reasons to be optimistic about our potential to effectively help wild animals in the future. Obviously, this is not a list of recommendations for what we should be implementing right now. Disease is a very significant source of suffering and premature death for animals. And to understand how harmful disease can be to animals, Think about the immense suffering that disease caused to humans before the advent of modern medicine. This is the situation for animals in the wild, and the harms caused by disease are worsened by a lack of access to treatment, and sometimes by a lack of opportunity to rest and recuperate. There are a number of ways we could potentially prevent or treat disease in wild animals. For example, we could provide medical treatment to individuals like we do for humans, and we could improve their environment so that disease is less prevalent. One particularly promising approach that you're probably already familiar with is vaccination. Vaccination programs provide a feasible option to dramatically improve the welfare of animals living in the wild, potentially on a large scale. Of course, there are many diseases, and we would need more research to understand which ones we can target safely and to understand the role that a specific disease may play in an ecosystem. There really are a lot of unknowns and a lot of research would need to be conducted. Potentially though, 
We could vaccinate our animals against horrific diseases like rabies and tuberculosis. I'll now provide three examples of previous vaccination programs that have been implemented in the wild. Now bear in mind that these were designed to satisfy human interests, not to help wild animals, but I think they illustrate the potential we have to reduce disease in wild animal populations. Rabies is an appalling disease for those infected by it. It's a viral disease that causes inflammation of the brain in mammals. It starts off with a fever and will progressively worsen with symptoms including paralysis, confusion, pain and eventually death. Rabies was causing a significant amount of suffering to the humans infected, as well as our companion animals who were also at risk. For these reasons, we created vaccination programs for foxes in Europe in an attempt to eradicate the disease. The vaccination was administered through aerial dispersal of baits containing the rabies vaccine, which were then eaten by the animals. Luckily, for the humans, domesticated animals and wild animals all at risk, we were able to successfully eliminate rabies from Europe. Ebola is a horrible disease causing a range of symptoms, including fever, difficulty swallowing and breathing, vomiting, diarrhea, and even internal bleeding. In humans, it's fatal in about 50% of cases. In gorillas, the mortality rate may be as high as 95%. An outbreak in Gabon and the Republic of Congo in 2002 killed over 5,000 gorillas and a vaccination program has been proposed to save the lives of the great apes. The vaccination program consists of either vaccines in bait or in hypodermic darts. Anthrax is a disease that causes fever, depression, convulsions, and death. And pilot vaccination programs have been developed against anthrax in animals. Vaccination has been shown to be effective in black rhinos, zebras, and cheetahs. Now, so far, they have only been vaccinated for conservationist purposes, but such vaccination programs could be extended to all animals who suffer from anthrax, regardless of their perceived use or value to human beings. I'm optimistic that we can effectively use certain types of vaccinations to reduce wild animal suffering in the future. If we put more resources into learning about the lives of wild animals, the diseases that plague them, and research the outcomes of vaccination projects like the three we have just discussed, we can potentially eradicate diseases that are torturing sentient beings. Another important factor that can seriously affect the lives of animals living in the wild is the lack of food. Many animals suffer through long periods of hunger and malnutrition, yet they survive. Others starve to death, often shortly after birth. The most common cause of starvation in the wild is simply being born in an environment where there is not enough food for all. Unfortunately, this is the situation of most animals who are ever born. Most species of animals have very large numbers of offspring. Many different species of arthropods and fishes, for example, can lay from thousands to millions of eggs. This means that the population would grow out of control if most of the offspring survived. In order for a population to remain stable, on average only one offspring per parent can survive to adulthood. The rest will die. So some eggs just won't hatch, uh, some animals will be killed by predators, siblings, or even parents shortly after birth. But one of the most common forms of death is by starvation shortly after being born or hatched. There are potentially a lot of ways we could reduce the amount of starvation in the wild. Um, one of the most obvious approaches, though probably not scalable, would be feeding programs. Oh my God, you can't just feed one species without that then affecting other species of animals. Oh my God, you're just gonna cause more suffering and we're all gonna die. Of course, we would need to understand how feeding programs could affect trophic cascades. Now, if the best available evidence were to suggest that we would in fact make things worse, then said intervention would not be implemented because the aim is to make things better. Another potential option to reduce the prevalence of starvation is to control the population sizes of animals. Now, humans are already implementing population control measures in wild animal populations for conservation and environmental purposes. However, commonly used techniques such as hunting, trapping, poisoning, introducing diseases or predators all typically cause suffering. We can potentially control the population sizes of animals without causing a significant amount of suffering, and contraception is one option that could be explored further. Several forms of contraception have been developed, such as hormonal contraception, surgical sterilization, and immunocontraception. I also personally recommend that we teach lions the pull-out method, like my granddad taught my dad, because that's always certainly working out. <laughs> Wait. If animal population sizes are controlled, each individual has access to more resources than they need. 
food can be abundant, diseases and parasites can be rare, and there would be less territorial conflict between animals. Does using contraceptives on wild animals seem unrealistic? Well, actually we've already done this, and I'm now going to give you two examples. In 1994, there was the first scientifically documented application of contraceptives to wild animals on the coastline of Delaware for environmental purposes. The PZP vaccine was used on a herd of wild horses. Within a year, zero population growth was attained and maintained for over a decade. Body condition increased, both infant and adult mortality decreased, and maximum lifespans increased by nearly a decade. The PZP vaccine was also found to be reversible for up to five years of consecutive treatment. Now, it's unknown whether longer periods of treatment are also reversible. Many councils try to reduce the population sizes of pigeons by starving them, poisoning them, or trapping and killing them. However, fertility control is an option that's being explored. Ovo control is a product which can be fed to pigeons to make them temporarily infertile. Of course, there could be undesirable knock-on effects of using fertility control to reduce the population sizes of pigeons, but the effects of ovo control are very short-lived. Breeding resumes after a couple of days unless the pigeons continue to be treated with ovo control. This means that if the best available evidence were to suggest that we are making things worse, we can reverse the effects of the intervention by ceasing to feed them with it. The fertility control that is being used on pigeons may reduce suffering in those populations, but what is perhaps even more exciting is that if we can find a way to have an effective, reversible impact, this can potentially be expanded into a larger scale. And we can use similar techniques on different populations to help more animals. Effective fertility control has the potential to prevent an enormous amount of starvation, and the animals could experience improved health and well-being as a result. Other than starvation and disease, there are of course many more cause areas of wild animal suffering, including but not limited to predation, sexual oppression, and accidents. And like starvation and disease, these cause areas are extremely complex, and we need more research to gain an understanding of what we can do to help. I'm not talking about all of these cause areas because I don't want this video to be ridiculously long, but there is one technology in particular that I think could be used in multiple ways and in multiple cause areas to reduce wild animal suffering. If safely applied, genetic engineering is an exciting technology that may provide an effective option to alleviate a lot of the suffering being experienced by wild animals. I'm not talking about alleviating a specific cause of suffering here, because this technology has the potential to target a wide range of unpleasant experiences. This technique can employ adding, deleting, disrupting, or modifying genes. Of course, we need to be extremely cautious when it comes to genetic engineering. It's incredibly complex, and more research needs to be conducted before we can responsibly implement it in the wild. And I understand that this sounds far-fetched. The term genetic engineering sounds like something out of a science fiction novel. I get it. But this technology is already here. The use of genetic engineering has already been proposed for combating human pathogens. For example, it's been proposed to alter the genetic code of mosquitoes who are carriers of malaria. Of course, genetic engineering should not be used on wild animals until we are sure that it can be applied safely and we have more information about how it could affect trophic cascades and the ecosystem as a whole. But the scientific community are optimistic that genetic engineering can be used to substantially improve human well-being. And if we're going to use this technology to, say, eradicate malaria, I see no reason why it can't eventually be used to improve the lives of non-human animals too. Gene drives can be used to propagate specific genetic variants throughout the population because they increase the probability that a specific genetic variant will be passed on from parent to child. This means that we can make particular genetic variants that are beneficial to the well-being of animals more abundant in the gene pool. And I understand that this may sound like something for the distant future, but actually projects using gene drives have already been proposed. Of course, the currently proposed applications of gene drives haven't been designed to improve wild animal welfare. Uh, current examples include exterminating insects that carry malaria, controlling invasive species, and an attempt to eliminate uh, herbicide and pesticide resistance. Like with any potentially powerful technique, gene drives could be misused and it could lead to unintended consequences. Of course, there are safeguarding procedures that have been proposed and tested, and I'll put the link in the description for those of you who want to learn more about them. So if gene drives could be applied safely, which genetic variants would we want to propagate throughout the animal kingdom? 
Now this is very complex, so I'm not giving any definite answers as to what we should be doing right now, but to give you an idea of what we might be looking for, we know there are specific genetic variants that influence pain threshold, and these could be a potential target. One gene that has been found to play a significant role in pain sensitivity is the SCN9A gene. Now, some variants of this gene confer unusually high or unusually low pain sensitivity without compromising function to any marked degree. If we drove the variant for low pain sensitivity throughout the animal kingdom, we might be able to dramatically reduce the amount of physical pain being experienced by wild animals without compromising the functional aspect of pain. Of course, I am making this sound far more simplistic than it actually is, and far more research would need to be conducted before something like this could be implemented safely. In fact, I can't emphasize enough that genetic engineering should only be implemented after sufficient research has been conducted. It needs to be used safely and responsibly. We might ideally want to implement it on small scales first, and we would want experts making sure that it's being used in the animal's best interests. Genetic engineering is a technology that will be used in the very near future. So the question is not if we're going to use it, but what are we going to use it for? Are we going to use it to, say, conserve species that we think are aesthetically pleasing to us? Or are we going to use it to actually improve the well-being of individuals? As I mentioned before, currently proposed projects using gene drives aren't designed to improve wild animal welfare. But I want to give you an example anyway so that it's clear that this technology is here. The Predator Free 2050 project is a New Zealand government program to completely eliminate eight invasive mammalian predator species from the country by 2050. They aim to eradicate species that have previously been introduced by humans and are now seen as pests and damaging to the biodiversity. Gene drives have been controversially discussed as an option, and to give you an idea of how this could work, they could release genetically altered rats who are only capable of producing male offspring so-called daughterless rats. As a consequence, the number of rats would reduce until they are eradicated from the area. Now, this would certainly be preferable over the common ways of controlling pests, which includes hunting, trapping, and poisoning. Some scientists, though, have been vocal in their opposition to the idea of using gene drives in the near future. It's of vital importance that we are cautious and that we conduct more research to learn about the potential consequences of using this technology in the wild. In fact, we need more research not only regarding genetic engineering and gene drives, but we need more research across the board before we can make any large-scale changes with the aim of reducing suffering in wild animals. As I've repeated throughout this video, at this point in time, we simply don't know enough about the lives of wild animals and all of the complex interactions within a given ecosystem. On a more general level, there are a few factors we would want to consider when designing interventions in any of these cause areas. And obviously I'm not able to provide a full picture of everything, but these are worth considering because they apply across the board. Reversibility simply refers to how reversible the effects of our intervention is. Due to widespread uncertainty about the potential adverse effects of our interventions on the ecosystem and on the wild animals themselves, it is possible that our intervention will turn out to do more harm than good. And for these reasons, we want the effects of our interventions to be reversible. While we want the effects of our actions to be reversible in order to reduce the risk of permanently making things worse, we also want the effects of our actions to be persistent if those effects are positive. Persistence refers to how long the effects of a given intervention will last in the face of natural processes. For example, if we build a castle out of sand at the beach, it's not going to be very persistent in the face of natural processes. However, if we build a castle out of stone, it's likely to persist for a long time. Persistence is also very important when it comes to the cost effectiveness of our interventions. We want to maximize the benefit given the cost because that means we can help more animals. The longer the effects of a given intervention last, the more cost effective, all else being equal. Therefore, when developing interventions, carefully evaluating the persistence of the proposed effects is kind of important, like really important. All else equal, the ideal intervention would be both persistent and reversible. So for example, if we think about the castle made from stone from before, the effects are likely to be persistent because the stone won't easily erode, but it's also very reversible because we have the technology to deconstruct the castle and put the stones back where we found them if we want to. Another factor is that the feasibility and viability of carrying out interventions to improve wild animal welfare is strongly influenced by public perception. 
In the future, we will have the technology to help wild animals more than we can possibly imagine today. But none of that will matter unless we have the desire to help them. Public perception is key in order to implement policies and interventions. And this is why, as individuals, one of the best things we can do to help wild animals is to raise awareness about the suffering they endure and convince other people to take this issue seriously. Before I end this video, I want to address a couple of objections that I've seen in the comment section of my previous video on this topic. Now, these objections got a few upvotes, so I'm keen to address them. A few people have mentioned that animals can't consent to fertility control, and therefore we shouldn't implement it. And of course, animals can't consent to fertility control, but they also can't consent to the starvation that will inevitably occur without it. And their offspring can't consent to being brought into the world to have a short and miserable existence. When it comes to domesticated animals, think about all the stray cats and dogs we have living on our streets. Most people acknowledge that pet owners should neuter their companion animals. I think even most of the vegans I've spoken to agree that this is the right thing to do, even though the animals themselves can't consent to the fertility control. With thousands of unwanted domesticated animals now being killed because shelters can't keep up with the number of animals being born, I think it's clear that fertility control can be used for an improvement in the well-being of animals. There are thousands of unwanted, neglected, and stray cats living on the streets of London, and their plight could easily have been prevented by neutering. For pet owners in London, this wouldn't even have to cost any money. The C4 scheme is a joint initiative by major animal charities in Greater London trying to solve the problem of too many cats, and they offer free neutering services and neuter feral cats as well. It's important to note that when sentient beings lack the capacity to give informed consent, we try to do what we think is in their best interest. This applies not just to consent to fertility control, but to any intervention designed to help wild animals, from simple environmental alterations to vaccinations to genetic engineering. So whenever someone doesn't have the capacity to give informed consent, be it a child, an intellectually disabled adult, or a non-human animal, we ought to do what is presumably in their best interest. This is why we treat our pets for infections and we vaccinate our children against diseases. If you're going to argue that we shouldn't try and help animals in the wild because they can't consent, well, you're gonna find it very difficult to hold that position consistently. I've seen a few comments suggesting that we're never going to eliminate suffering in the wild. The problem is too big and therefore we should focus on problems we can solve. Well, a problem with that is that you probably also hold the view that human suffering is inevitable and will never completely eradicate human suffering either. Does that mean that we shouldn't try to make the lives of human beings better? Should we stop treating people for cancer because you think human suffering is inevitable? Of course, the scale of wild animal suffering is enormous, but even implementing small-scale interventions can make a significant difference to the lives of at least some animals. Now, some may say that there's so many individuals out there that we can't really make a difference, but it makes a difference to the ones we help. And within the movement to reduce wild animal suffering, people are very aware of the scale of the issue, and they're very focused on effectiveness, meaning they want to help as many animals as much as possible given the resources available. Now, I've seen a few comments suggesting that I have a God complex. I don't think anyone would say I had a God complex if the individuals in question were human rather than non-human. Or hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should be writing emails to the Against Malaria Foundation complaining that this organization is playing God by trying to prevent malaria in the third world. I mean, what a bunch of idiots. Can't they see that humans always make things worse? No, let's not do that. My point is that we already play God when it comes to alleviating human suffering. We literally vaccinate our children against diseases. Or at least the parents who want to keep them do, you know. I'm not here to judge. We treat people for cancer. We provide medical treatment when someone breaks their leg. And call me crazy, but I think we should continue to play God and alleviate natural forms of suffering in human beings. So you might want to reconsider the position that we shouldn't try and help wild animals because we shouldn't be playing God. Because that position, if held consistently, is going to take you to some pretty dark places that the vast majority of people would find intolerable. After learning about the lives of wild animals, something that became increasingly clear to me is how indifferent evolution is to suffering. We are all here because genes replicate. All life is here because genes replicate. If we don't play God, who will? 
Are we supposed to just allow the world to be a place of misery forever? A lot of vegans seem to have a somewhat anti-human view of the world, where we see humans as the bad guys. And we have been the bad guys. Like a lot. We do terrible things. But I was thinking about the incredible fact that any of us exist at all. That a replicator came to be, and that this replicator had random mutations during the replication process, with most of these mutations being useless or harmful. But every now and then you get a mutation that increases the probability of replication. These replicators began to develop biological machines to increase the probability of replication. These biological machines developed consciousness. There is someone in there who can experience pleasant things and unpleasant things, because experiencing this seems to somehow increase the likelihood of replication. All of this seems meaningless, with no purpose. Unfortunately, the world is an incredibly unpleasant place for the vast majority of sentient minds inside these replicating machines. And this misery has been going on with no sign of stopping for hundreds of millions of years. And then we come along, and we begin to develop technologies that allow us to shape the world so that it's more pleasant for us. We have been able to use technology to shield ourselves from many of the unpleasant things in nature. But as this technology develops, we also gain the capacity to shape the world so that it's more pleasant for the other sentient beings who live here too. How incredibly lucky is it that some of these biological machines now have the appropriate replicating genes to give them the capacity to actually start making this world better? That's us. We have the cognitive ability to actually start pushing the world into a positive direction. We could create purpose in a world currently ruled by random mutations. We can play God like we already do when it comes to alleviating human suffering. I mean, what's the alternative? Letting the replicators play God? Let's try to create a better world, but not just for humans. Let's try to shape a more compassionate, less cruel world for all sentient beings. Yes, this is an extremely complex issue, and no, we haven't got all the answers. As I've said before, there's a lot of uncertainty here. Any of the approaches I've mentioned might or might not help in different circumstances, and the most cost-effective solutions almost certainly haven't been discovered yet. And if you're someone who's thinking about going to university, and you want to have a high-impact career, then perhaps consider studying biology and learning about the lives of wild animals. You can potentially have an extremely large positive impact on the lives of a lot of sentient beings due to the fact that this issue is so neglected. And for those of us who aren't in a position where we can go into academia and help try and find solutions, let's just start by acknowledging that this is a problem. That every sentient being matters. And it doesn't matter whether they're in a home, a factory farm, or a jungle. They matter. Their suffering matters. It matters to them, and it should matter to us. And this month's Patreon of the Month award goes to Daniel Sayer. And you have won. Let's see what I should give you. You can have this. No, actually, I really like that. I'm probably going to keep it. Sorry, Daniel. You can have this. This is great. I really want this too, but hey. I said I was going to do this thing, so I'm going to do it. You've won my copy of The Expanding Circle by Peter Singer. This is an amazing read, and it's now yours. And for those of you who do find my content valuable, do please consider supporting me on Patreon. Uh, it's not doing too well at the moment, so my position as a full-time activist is kind of precarious, so I'd really appreciate any support you could offer. Um, and as always, thank you so much for watching, and we will speak soon.